Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. You know, and click love about. We gotta read about one more bandit hunt. Our past actions against the bandits of the southwest have been effective. There is a marked decrease in banditry within the mountains, and our loyal landlords are repeating or reporting fewer and fewer armed robberies. Even still, it's not enough. With every bandit arrest or shot, there seems to be another dozen that pop out of the mountains. Why that is, of course, is still up to debate, though now is not the time to just debate such non issues. What is the need of addressing is the ever-increasing banditry. As we stifle the bandits on the streets, and more come up to replace each arrested felon, it's clear that we must redouble our efforts to crush these criminals. By incentivizing the police to crush uh, or to cre increase their focus on the bandits, we'll surely find the bandits to die off like the fading disease that they are. Peace in our time. When the government of Yunnan, there is a growing sense of relief and desperation. Everything which has been done to put an end to the insurgencies across Yunnan is coming to a head. They need to, after all, as we are running out of alternatives. It seems as though the last tricks up our sleeves have been exhausted. The knives we've used against the terrorists dulled, and the reserves of the police and anti-terrorist forces finally becoming depleted as, at this point. We have no alternative but to have put an end to the majority of, of the insurgencies. Otherwise, we are in serious trouble. All we can do now is close our eyes and hope. Hope that enough has been done, and hope that the armies have done enough. Hope that Yunnan will survive, as much as we can hope for. It'll become clear with time. All we know is that we have done our best, whether or not it was enough. The two brothers. Like brothers, Yunnan and Guizhu uh, uh, have stood together against anarchy, against secession. And like brothers, they have come to love each other and cooperate in everything. One army, one China, one spirit, one, one ruler as well. The unification of our two states is only natural. As Luhan puts his sights on his worthy goal, there's one. There's no one who can stop him. That'd be really good. Pa no possibility. It was, of course, inevitable. The world that Japan built so industrially over the past few decades has been raised on the most unstable unsta foundation of all, the blood and bones of millions of their enemies. When the news of the Yusuke crest hit Yunnan, one man knew what it truly meant and smiled. That did not mean everything was solved, however. Long Yuna also knew perfectly well that there was, he was in no position to do anything at all. With no man in a movement, Japan's weakness could offer a million opportunities without a single one of them ending up useful. Sitting at his desk alone late in the evening, he considered slowly and carefully all his options. Even after 20 years of kowtowing and looking at Japanese boots, the organized republic still lacked the trust. They were all traitors both to the comrades in the countries, and though the Japanese were the ones who stalled them power, they knew well the dangers of trusting a band of turncoats. The organized republic was allowing some 50,000 men for its own self-preservation, that was it. Yunnan's army on its own, numbered nearly enough to trounce them if it was used properly. Luhan could, at this moment, cement his name in Chinese history as a champion of the people if only. But it was pointless to dwell on if onlys and what ifs. It was possible that his cousin would wake up to his senses and remember his duty, his honor as a yi. It was also possible, unfortunately, probable that he would remain blinded by the idea of serving the Nanjing government and more drastic actions would have to be taken. One thing was sure, however. Japan's new world order was collapsing around its feet, and sooner or later someone would have to take the opportunity. One way or another, of course. Well, I want more army military professionalism as possible, but what's well, the status quo? Oh, we can't do this one. Oh, we need more guns. Dang it. Oh, we're so close. How close are you actually getting done? Actually, you'll be fine. Could revive the Burma Road first. We do have a, quite a bit of political power. Um, you know what? It's already 63. Uh, we could try. I'm not sure. Might have to replay this sometime, maybe. We'll see, but we could try it. Because we're so, so close to getting 50 political power anyway, so. Uh, you might as well do that one. Why not? Cool. What's the status quo? Luan sat at his desk and had been spending the day filing a report, hearing from aides and drinking heavily. By the time Chen had finally come to speak with Luhan again, the night had begun to dawn, Luhan began to lose, lose lucidity. Not enough hour not to not want to listen to Chen's latest report. Tell me, Chen, what's happening? Luhan sat in his office, slumping against the armchair, squinting at Chen and his arm full of papers. So your approach to the insurgents have been def definitive, for lack of a better term. While suppression seems to have been the route taken, initial operations were mildly successful. The insurgents' operations have been considerably diminished and seem to be coming to a close. However... The ranks of these insurgents have been filled with the ranks of, of the poor. The, the slummers, farmers, criminals, you know. Luan said, still processing what he was being told. While crime and terrorism has undergone a marked decrease, our resources have been put under considerable strain, and we can only hope that the situation stabilizes. Luan frowned, although it seemed only half conscious. Stabilizes? Luan squinted his eyes and maintained his uneven stare. And leaned forward. What do you mean, stabilize? Chen felt himself starting to sweat. Sir, you know, has been fighting against insurgents non stop for the last months. It's become difficult beyond measure to maintain a proper state apparatus, and we're suffering for it. Luan looked at Chen with an upset, almost neutral face. Look to his face. We're not doing everything we can, Chen. Chen frowned and let out sight. That's just it, sir. We are. We lack the power to, to land a decisive blow against insurgencies despite hard work. Oh well. So what studying could mean. Life is good. 
A simple, bland sentence that begs further clarifying, doubly so if one would look at the situation of the province. They finally land riddled with diseases, crime, and back-breaking work. The meager earnings of the common peasantry could even manage split between extortions, extortion, tolls, and even the bare necessities to even feed and survive to the next day. For each dawn of the sun was just another gamble they would be caught in the crossfire bandits. The police force or simple work accident in the farms or mines. Of course, whoever would apply to that statement to Luhan with nothing more than acknowledgement or praise would find themselves simply dragged off as an insurgent, as a savior of you now would simply go about his day drawing the fruits of his fiefdom. For Luhan, the only opinion that mattered in this land was, is his own, nobody else's, and so life is good. Insurgents are getting weaker by the day, and whatever nay say otherwise is simply partisan propaganda. The clique and his faithful army have to control the land to each tree that dots the landscape, and the children and workers of the land can wake up every day at dawn with hope in their hearts, for they couldn't be granted a better purpose and quality of life than what they have right now. Life is good, Yunnan, for every single person, and for him even more so. And so with that mantra in his head, it got in his mouth, he wrote another letter to He Ying King, Ying King to reiterate the positives of joint collaboration and unification with territories it could bring for the people and especially for them. A victim. Oh. Rivers of Triumph. Lobster War ends. We are not enemies. Pick up his friends. Setting the trap. The man's home is his castle. Huh. Safe and sound. Out of sight, out of mind. <coughs> A formal announcement. One indivisible. United at last. Well, that's really good to get more admin efficiency. Two hands of one body. Ooh. United economy. Ex close to ye exploitation. Uniform legal code. Oh, that's not bad. You lose quite a bit of political power. A place for he. Okay. He must retire. Okay, a handshake. I'm gonna, we're going to try to do it. We are not enemies. Well, while the unification of two states is inevitable, the process must not be marred with violence, which would betray the friendship between the two states. And since we will look into more peaceful and civilized way to bring our few opponents up to our point of view and work with he rather than against him. We could try to evict him, but I don't want to use equipment. I want to save as much equipment as possible. Oh, and now poverty rate change is getting worse. God dang it. Um, carrot and stick. That's okay. That one's really important to do, though. Go, go, and we got three more divisions. Nice. Twelve combat with which? No, nah, not bad. Not too shabby. I'm not sure whether we want unyielding defender or offensive or I don't know. We'll see. We'll definitely see. We're not enemies. Range of conference. Civilian war support would be pretty nice. Public fire is pretty nice too. Talking may be a boring and lengthy process, but no one can doubt that it is at least cheaper than war. Arranging a dangerous location for the discussion of the future of the southwestern provinces is, of course, only the first step, but no doubt it will take time to arrange venue deserving of this momentous occasion. Echoes of a bygone it passed. Lu Ha gently placed a guy wand upon the wooden tray set out before him, his eyes fixated towards the rugged hills and verdant trees of Yunnan extending towards the limitless horizon. He felt the heat of the freshly brewed puer tea, searing the roof of his mouth, the tea leaves coating his tongue, he paid no attention to it. He was gazing towards the east, gazing towards his past. Beyond the great plateau was a land which he had familiarized himself with during decades past. The sprawling plains of Hunam, the sodden banks of the Yangtze, the soil that had once tread upon with the rest of his comrades of the 60th Corps, charging towards the onslaught of Japanese gunfire, towards the glory and sorrow of dying for one's homeland. You remember those days spent in the rubble and debris of Zhuzhuao and Changsha, watching the shores of the Poyang Lake. He hated Japan back then, he still does, and yet here he was. Luhan took another sip of his hot beverage. The aroma reminding him of this land which he called home, Yunnan, a place where he had sacrificed so much for to ensure the safety of its people, of his people. When he and his cousins submitted to the sharpened blades of the Japanese, they did so for the good of their people. So how could any so many of his countrymen fail to see su as such? Why would he forever be plagued with insurgency after insurgency, compromise after compromise, just to keep his domain afloat? He took a deep breath and his tea calming his senses. He did not like the current order of affairs, his citizens certainly did not like them, but his uh, options were limited. In order to protect Yunnan, it was either the bayonet or the pen. One of the options was untenable, and so he could only slave away under the omnipresent gaze of his former enemies. Lu Han carried the wooden tray away from the pavilion. He had more business to contend with. Renru Fuzong. Cool. Go for PPR or everything else. Okay, cool. Energy conference, which we're doing next.
glimmer of sunshine, thoughts filtered in and out of his head as Luhan strolled back and forth slowly across his open courtyard, attempting to process his thoughts as he reread recent reports from the east over and again and over and over again within his mind. Another development project was undertaken by President Gao Zongwu of the Republic of China, a nation he's still technically a part of ever since his ascension. Lu Han had always had mixed opinions about President Gao, man who held so much promise and opportunity for China's populace, championing a term that had been referenced and spoken of uncountable times within the borders of his homeland, modernization. A concept that has been the center of Chinese administration since the waning days of the forlorn Qing dynasty, a notion demanded by the students of May 4th. A dream proclaimed loudly by Dr. Sun Yat-sen, but alas, the rays of hope were eventually disclosed by the rising sun. Even as China's trampled by the jackboot of the Japanese dogs, modernization still remained as prevalent as ever. Would modernization not be the rod to which China could shatter the fetters which bound it, awaken the slumbering giant, and brush off the dom domination of Japan once and for all? He certainly believed so. Perhaps it would be more amenable to the president. Perhaps it was a key to end our sorrows. Sure, people might have to endure through periods of hardship, but that's not anything unfamiliar or new. The long-term benefits would outweigh any price. He stood still, frozen in place, as he contemplated this dilemma. A few minutes later, his psyche had been cleared. Perhaps the president would need some resources, a meager sacrifice for the future. Winning friends. Luhan has many friends, and he knows just how to keep them money. He seems that in the recent relaxation, he, Ying King, has been forgetful of his old friends, a mistake that Lu promises will not be repeated under supervision. Meeting with industrious politicians, landlords, and even artists consume Lu Han's time. It would not do be imp it would not do to be impersonal at this time. But we've got some comments to go through, such as Sun Long's ten thousand mile march. Uh darn, did someone give Lu Han a lemon to eat or something? Someone says, a road to Long Yun, road to the Great Unification. Yes, sir. Let's F and go. Someone says, does, or says, does Thailand have his own focus? Do, or have their own focus tree? Can you play it if they do? Sure, maybe if they do want to have them. Someone says, can you play as Kemerovo again, but instead of Prince Yuri, play as Princess Lydia. Yeah, we can. Someone says, you need to grind a lot if you want a successful campaign. Oh, yes, we do. We definitely need to grind a lot. There's some Kunming. It is our earnest hope that you and your brave soldiers in the Burmese section of the National Revolutionary Army are doing well, and that your labors for the freedom of the Chinese homeland are continuing to bear fruit. In accordance with established custom, we General Zhang Zesheng and An Empu would like to request covert arms shipments and proceeds of, or proceeds of your opium sales to better arm us and the MPA. If this request suits your assessment of the situation, we will make the necessary arrangements to see its implementation at the earliest possible time. In a previous correspondence, you expressed concern about the loyalties of the Vice Governor of Yunnan, the former King of Yunnan, Long Yun. We have assessed him closely, and we are of the mind that the years after the fall of Chongqing to the Japanese imperial scum have not dulled his patriotism and devotion to our country, in fact. We are certain that General Long has the interests of the motherland at heart, and will seemingly join the insurrection against his traitor cousin when the time comes. In the meantime, we'll continue to arrange for people to be sent to sent down the Burma Road to be trained for eventual surgency to liberate us from the Japanese oppression. Long leave for China. Signed, General Zheng Zisheng, General An Apu. They're up to something, are they? Preparing a conference. Zhao so, Zhu leaned over his map to the region with intentful eyes, surrounded by his fellow staff members. His assignment was clear find a city to host upcoming conference. He knew it would be important in that that would decide the fate of Yunnan and Guizhou, and he had to make his decision carefully. He carefully inspected both provinces, reading through dozens of names of settlements ranging from the smallest village to the largest metropolis. <clears throat> he thoughtfully looked over the implications of choosing each place in his mind and sought to find a balancing town. He examined the border region of the map, coming across the small city of Fu Yuan. It was inside of Yunnan, but close enough to the border to reach a big balance. It was big enough to be able to host the event, but not too big. He ultimately decided it would be the correct choice and instructed his subordinate to carry the message to the diplomats. The messengers were drawn out, and Zhao's, Zhao's choice was set in stone. A thoughtful choice. Opening the debate. A city has been chosen, an invitation sent out. Delegates have carefully chosen for the enthusiasm for the unification, of course, form the body, and despite he's alone resistance to the debate shall soon be started with or without him, a few friends he has left. It has been made clear that it would be better to have his voice be present at negotiations rather than not present at all. Well, we've done really well at suppressing... Well, somewhat well, suppressing these guys. This cost? Oh, you can do that one. These guys really hurt us. Stability and GDP ratio modifier. Because now we have a yearly deficit. We do have more growth, though. So, And honestly, the deficit, I mean, it's not great to have. Oh, yeah, that's not good. Yeah. 1.34 billion. Temp tax hike. We could do that. But, whatever. An audience with the Enlightened One. Yi Zheng Ying, leader of, <clears throat> of what the remainder of the Communist Party of China, trekked up the mountains of northern Vietnam, a path they had traveled several times before. He had a man to speak to. To be exact, he was seeking the leader of the Viet Men, Ho Chi Minh, an old friend of his. Embracing swiftly, or briefly, the two men shared a drink and a meal and then f fell to talking. After asking each other's fam about each other's families and trading stories about things that had taken place in the time since they'd last seen each other, they fell to reminiscing. 
I look back to the warm, happier past, a past in which Mao Zedong was still alive, a past in which China was still free and able to fight against the Japanese imperialist menace. Then their minds wandered to the present. Ho asked Yi about how the CPC's return to Yunnan was faring. He nodded satisfied, while Lu Han and Jia Wei's traders had successfully pushed the CPC out of Yunnan and Guangxi. They recently succeeded in resuming infiltration warfare in the southwest, thanks to certain Vietnamese friends of ours, among others, he said, smirking at Ho, who matches Grim with one of his own. He continued, just like your Viet Men, our Communist Party certainly not forgotten how to fight the Japanese imperialists and the running dogs. We'll not rest until China's free. Start of the conference. Today, representatives and delegates from Yunnan and Guizhou alike arrived in the small city of Fu Yuan to discuss a unified Yunnan and Guizhou. The conference opened with a series of handshakes and friendly statements. These were, of course, just opening pleasantries, and soon enough seats were taken and papers were shuffled. The conference had begun, so it begins with winning over support. In order to unify and integrate Guizhou, we decided to host a conference in Fu Yuan to discuss what a unified Yunnan and Guizhou would look like. As the makings of the conference finish up, of course, we want to start making preparations of our own. Ying King has a group of associates with a significant influence in Guizhou and Ying Kin's clique itself. We decided to try and bring them over to our side in order to completely outmaneuver Ying Kin in the conference. Doing so has proven to be easy. With a series of bribes and heavy-handed pulling, we've managed to completely win over almost all of Ying Kin's most influential friends. With this, it's almost guaranteed that we will come out of the conference with what we want. The strongest deck always wins. This is costing us way too much money now. The only issue is the NRA. Yeah, that's pretty bad. But hey, more growth is not bad, but still. Dead going up, not good. Not good. The Zealot makes a move. Oh, look at that. Wow. Oh, yeah, miscellaneous costs. That does all sorts of stew. While Zhang was personally aligned with the National Protection Army, he formally refused to take more action than words and small speeches on paper. He was just a university staffer devoid of definite means to support the movement, even though he did secretly fund them by, bit by bit with a part of his salary. But the true reason for his apparent silence was that he did not dare risk exposing his true identity in case Luhan's occasional crackdowns <coughs> fell upon him. He kept uh, contact with a few officials and officers within Luhan's cabinet to serve the movements organized by him and his comrades. On the other hand, his attitude towards the bandits is a more complicated one. While he sympathized with the causes and the reasons behind their actions, he didn't think it was justified what the groups did to innocent peasants and citizens, though landlords and the wealthy were, of course, fair game. But that didn't prevent Jiang from taking action to help the poor. Today, he was in, he was in his office, doing some of his routine work. The secretary standing beside him gave him a letter. After reading it, he scribbled out some replies to his superior and asked for the next steps to carry out. Nodding and smiling, the man left the room, and Jiang lost himself briefly in his thoughts. At a brief moment, he went out, too, to join another strike he had organized in support of the workers and to remonstrate with Luhan's government. The agenda was relatively simple. He gave a speech denouncing Luhan and Nanjing's rule. They taught worker music, usually social songs of the twist, so the audience invited more people to come for his talks and activities. He didn't join his student society, back at his office. Jiang packed up and made for his next destination, a place where a group of bandits was rumored to be hiding. There may be more to this fellow than we thought, and the matter is economics. The economics of Yunnan and Guizhou are nearly completely different from each other, and as such, the matter of how a unified economy would manage is a the large dividing factor. Someone proposed that the two provinces of Yunnan and Guizhou would equally manage the decentralized economy in order to cater to the different eco economics each region has. Others, however, believe a far more centralized economy managed directly by Kunming would allow for more efficient and smooth running economic program. A debate was held in the conference, the delegates decided on. Because right now, we're actually pretty, into, pretty um, in the middle ground, huh? Decentralization, centralization. Oh, uh, we have more decentralization. That helps out. Um, manage equally manage the decentralized economy in order to cater the different ec economics each region has. We're going to decentralize just because that that would make both sides work really well. Maybe I don't know. I could be wrong. Um. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Two hands of one body, united economy. Maybe that'd be better. Maybe that would have been better to do. Do you think his goods goes up, though? Two hands of one body? Well, you know, and Guizhou may be brothers in all but name. Their economies have developed in different directions by necessity, with different companies taking different approaches to the exploitation of China's resources. While the idea of economic uniformity may be romantic, for the sake of common prosperity, we should make the merger of one, be one of politics only, and let the markets continue their course. <clears throat> Close the exploitation. Uniform legal code. Yeah, we definitely do that one. Break one law, just hop over the border, and you are scot free. Chaos and trade in the media and everyday life is the only reward for being so lazy as to unify without actually unifying. The laws of Yunnan were approved by Lu Han himself and were virtually identical to Guizhou's until recently. We would do we would be doing a disservice by accepting anything less than total uniformity. Matter of legal code. Crime in the twin provinces of Yunnan and Guizhou is a hard pressing problem, in some regions more than others. <clears throat> the E slaveholders in Yunnan present in especially controversial debate over the legality of slavery. In order to combat crime, the matter of a legal code has to be decided about. Some believe the legal codes already in place in each province work fine, and that two legal codes for the two regions will work best. Others propose a unified nation that have having a legal 
United Legal Code in order to combat crime at a unified scale again. A debate was held and the Congress brought forth a decision. We'll go with that one. I mean, I don't know if this is going to be right or wrong. I'm not going to be worried about this too much, but still. He must retire. It depends what he wants to do. <clears throat> I mean, if he wants to do, be a general, that's fine with me, man. Hmm. An honorable retirement is in order, but he must go. I don't know, man. Future of Yi Yin King. The next topic to be discussed was that of the future of the dude, the de facto warlord of Guizhou. A simple amount of leverage now held by the Yunnan clique has allowed them to completely outmaneuver Yin King, or Yin Kin, and place him as an inevitable ruler of a unified Yunnan and Guizhou. Along with this, they are also now able to dictate the future of Yin Kin and his position in Guizhou. Some believe he should be allowed to settle down in the country and live out the remainder of his days peacefully. Others wish to see him completely exile from the region in order to prevent any conflict between the two provinces to rise again. The topic was fierce debate over, and a decision was reached. Um, let him settle down. Yeah. Oh. No, once negotiated the fish, we will gain the following. Oh, we're going to lose all this political power. Whoops, my bad. I will. Yeah, that's actually really bad. We lose all that, but whatever. Um, yeah, this one's going to be good to do. Oh, that's actually really good now. Still costing a lot of money, but whatever. I thought during the, the uh, conference we would lose this. Yeah, once they're finished, we'll gain the following. But then what happens if when we... Hmm. <clears throat> oh, well. We'll see what happens. If it, if it doesn't go well for us, then we'll, we'll change things up. He was and is a great general, competent administrator, and he knows the province of Guizhou better than any other man in China. <clears throat> he agrees to step down, while he agrees to step down as provincial governor, and Song Yin King as governor regional advisor would guarantee a swift and seemingly transition of power, as well as pay respect to his service to the country and her people. Like I said, if it doesn't go well for us, then I'll change it up, but still. Wow, we really killed those guys off. Yeah, maybe it was a mistake. Losing all this political power is probably a huge mistake. Place for he. <clears throat> of course, do we get rid of him? Like, or get rid of everybody pretty much after uh, this? Like, once we, when the war starts? A handshake? Ceremony. A promise. Ceremony. The die is cast. map will be drawn. Let all Asia know the provinces of Yunnan and Guizhou shall, by mutual agreement, be soon merged into the province of the southwest, Jinan. The start of this new era has been accompanied by parades, bands, grand dinners, and all the other mellow dramas of the state. The people rejoice. We're going to have, like, no money. Or at least no political power. Money-wise, we might be really, 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 really flipping well, but other than that... God, I want more production units. Oh, we did really well with this one. Garrison size, natural growth. Place for he. Ceremony. A promise. With the announcement over and the deadline drawing near, it's only expected that those patriots who bravely aided the creation of Jinan be rewarded in turn. And they all intend to ensure Lu Lan is aware of the fact. Land, gold, currency, positions in the government, and protection from the free markets have all been promised. And what kind of man would Lu be if he were not true to his word? Ammunition. Thus, even today, the Chinese person remains in prison. It falls upon him to open his eyes, seek out his own shackles, shatter them upon the monoliths of justice and equity, and thus attain liberation for himself and his brethren. Liu Li Yi Lang froze his hand, placed the fountain pen back into the bottle, and grasped the paper closer to his bespeckled face as he inspected the still wet paragraph. <clears throat> the opening sentence would have to be even more evocative. Maybe he had the only difference is that his shackles now have a way of concealing themselves somewhere. But crucially, however, the Chinese and Chinese rhetoric was simply too overused at this point. Liu let out an exhausted chuckle. Perfection in the trade of journalism was indeed a myth, not an obtainable possibility. His pals in the Min Mang might critique his to shreds for sure, but it'd be more than welcome. He needed every pair of literary eyes on the newest op-ed, as he always did to see to it that it would set out to do exactly what it was supposed to. To reach out to whoever was there that could read and was still reading, and the sound of the bugle in their hearts. To knock it into them that Tokyo and Nanjing were co-conspirators in tyranny, that all their promises and ramblings about pan Asian fraternity are but one big, bad, cruel joke. Stifling yet another yawn, he turned towards his left wrist, the tick-tock of his watch punctuating the silent Chongqing midnight. In seventeen minutes, the 
Jiang He grocery store two blocks down the street would be open for business. At 24, the back door in the alleyway would swing open. All Liu had to do was then to step into the shadowy embrace and deposit the envelope, and the pot plan worked its magic. Then his ammunition, his latest contribution to China's underground free press, shall be delivered to the right hands. Shaking his fatigue away, the fighter hunched over his desk once more. God, I hope I made the right choice. Oh, yeah, do they have a focus tree? I, I don't think they do yet, no. Yeah, they don't, yet. But we just, you know, devs are still working on stuff, so. We'll get there eventually. I hope I don't think I made the right choice with all this stuff. With this stuff, like, I didn't want to lose 50 political power immediately and guns and stuff like that. Maybe it would have been better just to take them out. That probably would have been better, probably. I don't know. But, anyways, a handshake. Oh, look at Hitler. Well, the debate over all that is left to do is a vote for integration. Most considered to be a foregone conclusion, but before the votes were counted, all eyes were on He Ying Kin and Luhan to seal the arrangement with a handshake. Crap. That's gonna, we're going to lose a lot of political power. Like 0 .5, 0 0.65 every day. So we, we have a, no political power then. So we better use it while we have it. Oh, while well, we do really well with these guys. Get in the stick. Why are these guys still so high? Am I supposed to like, set these guys or something? I mean, the game is lagging because of the Civil War, but still. Well, there they go. Have fun, guys. Oh, we're looking better on the yearly deficit, at least, though. And then it's going to lag really hard because Muscovy is going to like pop out again. And we're like, ah. <laughs> but if we can get them, that'd be a lot more resources, which would be nice. <clears throat> we don't get any extra steel. We get aluminum and tungsten, which is we could trade for away and get some energy as well. But if you more fact, he's a promise kept. Jun Lu Han is many things to many different people. The old and bitter nationalist. He is a traitor who deserves nothing less than death. The, uh, to the general peasantry, he is a news tyrant in a long line of neglectful rulers that occasion takes a grain. To his friends, however, Lu Han is a man of his word. Riches, material, and otherwise flow from him like a cornucopia of political corruption. Well salaried positions with minimal responsibility are handed out of the drop of a genius or genuine velvet hat. Piles of money and gold fill up marble rooms and overflow into well furnished hallways. Tracts of pristine virgin lands are cleared of dirty peasants and signed away with a stroke of a gold plated pen. There should be no limit to Luhan's generosity or the loyalty of his friends. They are fortunate uh, to have such a generous ally, a, fortunate, a fortune that they will have to be careful to remember in the future. After all, this, what is given, can be easily just taken away. It seems loyalty does have a price. A handshake, and then united at last. Oh, coup for Lou. Oh, crap. Oh. Oh. In a mismatched, disorganized operation of catastrophically disappointed failure, or disappointing failure, a small clique of idiotic Guizhouf officers launched a coup with the intention of disposing Luhan and separating the province once more. Needless to say, they blundered through the entire horse crap plan they concocted in a drunken super the night before. The sleep deprived conspirators rolled into what was once the capital of Guizhou in a single army cart and declared themselves a the vanguard of the People's Revolution. Local garrison pursued them out of the city and through the country countryside in a moderate speech chase until the driver lost control of the pliers or alcohol and the plan went tumbling over a cliff. They didn't put much effort into that. The final disruptions are over. The names have been changed. <clears throat> and the world notified. All that's left now is for Luhan himself to make the trip and officially declare the work of the government to begin. Two brothers no more. Today the name Jinan shall be spoken all across all of Asia and let no man separate what has been united in, or unified. Oh boy. Oh boy, we do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm, of course, as well, so. Serbi boys rise up. We make we make less guns, which is still not bad. Well, let's make it some anti-tank now, which is good. It's looking better already. Less growth, but whatever. And poverty's getting worse. But getting this done would be really good, but it's going to take so long. God, I hope we do well here. Well, the world's a mess. Himmler. Nice. Adrius is doing okay for now. Spears really trying to kill him off. Ah, Europe is on fire. What else is new? 0.11. Not bad. And halfway done. More than halfway done for Revive the Burma Road. Oh boy. Oh, um, Muscovy must be exploding. Yeah, they, they, they make the game look like really hard. I'm not sure what to do about this guy. This, these people, so. A handshake. End of the conference. The conference of Fu Yan Yan has now officially come to a close as all matters presented during it have been solved one way or another. Oh boy. Ultimately, unification has been chosen despite the choices made in the conference. For better or for worse, the two cliques of Yunnan and Guizhou are now unified politically, legally, and militarily into a single state presiding over the region. That she's made. 
for the pl planned economy. Did it even change at all? Fully decentralized gives us more um, output, which is what we really want. Construction speed of resource efficiency game is not bad too, but... Also, we're 40 out of a possible 100. Okay. Anything else here? Oh, we're actually losing political power every day. Crap. You know what? We're still going to grab this one, though. Which... God dang it. Maybe that was the wrong thing to do. Can we get cooed now? I think we cooed in 64, so... Hopefully that removes everybody. G non unification. That should be removed eventually. Crap. Well, that's better than what was earlier. Point zero four is not bad still, but still. Uh, why'd I do that route? Word prosperity is nice. Arm of the Southwest is still pretty good. G non insurgency. Once we get rid of that, that'll definitely help us out. Because that hurts our growth, stability, political power gain. Uh, Production use to GDP ratio modifier. Way more costs. Way, way, way more costs. Worse construction speed. Untapped potential really sucks as well. So I'm hoping this does goes well for us here. Oh, we got him. Oh, we didn't get into the divisions. Oh, it sucks. On solid ground. A long last hopes to become a reality. Yunnan and Guizhou are both under the rule of Luhan, and the Yunnan clique has become under protection, or come to protect another province. While well, I faced unrest and protest from some of the result, it was never truly in doubt. One state, one army, one leader. As the maps were drawn, her streets were named, we're finally in position to advance with order and progress unimpeded. We actually got them, which might not necessarily be a good thing, honestly. Just because now we have more provinces to defend. Especially with all these extra, like, little uh, provinces here, so... Yeah. Oh, change the flag, though. Jinan autonomous government. We got one more production unit, which is not bad. So now we have enough for support equipment as well. E economically? Or economy-wise? Ooh. Our growth is not bad. Well, at least we're not too high in debt. Still losing a lot of political power. Alright, well, it is what it is. Bring in the an investment. Or 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Since Chongqing, Zheng Weiguo's life had revolved around these numbers, and to count them. Nope. Uh, for himself was a succor to his fading, crumbling self. He lay prone on the concrete floor some time after labor hours. A cold allo alloy of cement rose to meet the heat of his body, and his extremities tingled with electric expectation. He slid his palms under his figure and began to slowly push up against the gravity. One, two, three, four. Evident nearly twenty years since Zhang's capture, he was no longer a young man. As he did this count, the generalissimo's son became accurately aware of his age. His joints and fingers cracked at the first sign of pressure. His back bothered him the most, despite daily exercise that rose with an acerbic retort to the pressure exerted by the rest of his body. Soon, Zhang was panting, exhausted, despite himself. He stood and looked at the tiny sliver of light at the back of his prison cell. Leveraging himself on the grates, he pulled himself up to look at the coast of Zhejiang. The sun was setting out west, the waves frothed with foam. The eastern sea lost the reddish blush that lay overlaid its surface, little by little as the day surrendered to the night. The stars began to scatter in the skies above. The smell of brine brought memories of home to Zhang. It was beauty seen through a slit in the door of a stranger's home, glimpsed one frame at a time. As Zhang let go of the grates and landed on his feet, he lay prone and began his push-ups once again. One, two, three, four. Once more up the Burma Road. Oh, oh, we have seven. Oh, okay, you know what? Even though we lose the power, we have seven now? Oh. Oh, we could be building more civilian factory. I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, eh. As long as it doesn't hurt us too badly. It's not great right now, but we just need, like, I'm thinking we just need more stuff. I want more support equipment. I want more guns. Basic anti-tank is not bad. Go with that one. There you go. See what you can do about that. Li Mi had spent most of the night working in his office. The cabinet meeting had called by Zhang Zilan. While necessary to discuss the plans, the insurgency had cost Li Mi valuable time in actually planning said insurgency. Li had two, res had two responsibilities to the NRA. The first was to manage all guerrilla operations against the Japanese. The second one was to conduct the opium smuggling that provided the much needed capital fund as first responsibility. Li Mi knew that many within the NRA were opposed to the smuggling of opium. Even Song Zilian himself wasn't comfortable with it, although at least he understood his necessity. Indeed, if the NRA didn't engage in the smuggling of opium, then it would have run out of resources years ago, unable to pay its own men or fund its own operations. Lee reminded himself of this whether he had himself had doubts of his own actions. He knew that the dream of returning to China trumped, uh, trumped all. Lee's mind returned to the task at hand, planning the insurgency. After years of exile, the NRA was finally preparing the glorious return to China, and it all started with an uprising in Kunming. Of course, it wouldn't be hard for local officials in the city to notice a massive amount of men and weapons being smuggled in for preparation, so, as a countermeasure, Li had prepared bribes. Millions of yuan and yen, all generated via opium smuggling and other listed operations, would be found under the Kunming to keep these officials from talking to the Japanese. Our return is imminent. 
More deficit? Crap. Bring in the investment. Perhaps unavoidably investment from both out the outside individuals and our own native entrepreneurs ground to a halt in the recent instability. Now that our state has settled, it is time to announce ourselves open to investment from all of the sphere. Many local monopolies and leftovers from his rule have, been, have to be removed from the stage, and the time has never been better for the development of the land of the prosperity of all of Asia. Certain trees are acting. Pretty normal. Alive for alive. Away woke up to the same numbness in his arm. It had become the first sensation to meet him every morning since he had arrived at the camp, and that dull smell of earth. It had always crept in, no matter how tightly he wrapped his frayed blankets around himself. Everything was unsophisticated here, yet these last few nights he had sound, sought the soundness in his life. He was safe, but not quite home. Across from him on the far right side of the camp, there was another man who had been dragged here the night before. His rough shod uniform betrayed him as a conscript, and one subservient to Luhan. As such, a conscript had not been fortunate enough to welcome be, to be welcomed like Wei had been. There was always a guard with a trained eye on him and a hesitancy throughout the rest of the camp to share with him any of their dwindling supplies. Wei had heard they had only let him live because he pleaded so desperately for his life. For this reason, he felt a sympathy towards the man which he could not ignore. So he unraveled himself from the mass of blankets, dusted himself down as best he could, and approached him. The conversation did not come easy between them at first, but soon enough it flowed listlessly. Meandering gently through hopes and fears, love and heartbreak and life and death, it did not last as it never could. In the middle of the particularly heart-wrenching remembrance of the night, Wei abandoned everything. The conscript leaped to his feet and began to wail in alarm. He raised his rifle, the shot in the camp, and let off the round after round into his enemy. Wei held his ground too, but he knew the conscript was far too exposed to the soldiers, and as he went about to shout at him to get a, to get back a bullet tore through his conscript's chest. Wei rushed over, though it was already too late, and he could see blood starting to pool on the other side of the hole that led to, that had carved whilst he held the man. As the body began to sink, low and lifeless and his own, he soon realized he had not even thought to ask for the poor conscript's name. Another nameless casualty left to an unmarked grave. The consolidation is Jinan. Jinan may be officially united on paper, but only now is the province is the province truly and well won. The administration lives and breathes. Bureaucrats simply stamp papers throughout hallways like cells in a bloodstream. The beast of state is an organism like any other. The beast master, Luhan, keeps it on a tight leash. The bureaucracy, no matter how large, unwieldy, or disorganized, exists to serve him and him alone. The state of Jinan rests like an egg in his palm. Luhan sits upon a throne of ink and paper. The bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. Hey, got more civilians, which is pretty nice. Reports of the governor's office. What? Zeng and An are having clandestine meetings with the MPA officers? Yes, governor, they are. Here are the documents confirming it. Luan looked at the papers handed to him. There was, there was in black and white, and crisply written Chinese. Zeng Zisheng and An Anpu were having clandestine meetings with the National Protection Army officers. Dismissing the official that had come in with the report, uh, Lu sat and thought about his course of action. If he had absolute power, perhaps he might have prosecuted them for treason. The problem was that Liu Lu Han was not, for all that he might argue otherwise, the absolute ruler and autocrat of Yunnan. He still has cousin to reckon with, even though I did not typically respect Yu Long Yun as a person and as a leader, he was still to consider everything that came out of his mouth. So he decided to do nothing, more to avoid provoking his cousin than out of any feelings for Zhang Yunnan. After all, if his cousin was provoked into revolting, Yunnan would be torn into shreds right then and there. Walking out of his office, Lu Han went to his cousin's office in the government compound, looking at Long. Lu didn't see anyone uh, see anyone aware of any kind of conspiracy. In fact, the man seemed completely unaware of anything secret going on around him. Looking at Long's apparent contentment, Lu resolved himself on doing nothing and greeting his cousin. Good afternoon, cousin. How are you doing? How are you doing, cousin? Bring in the talent. Oh, yes, please. Oh, we get a research slot. Whether from the esteemed ranks of our own notable men or from Japanese trained company men, the factories cannot function without able technicians and experienced administrators to run them. Let me know that Jinan is a land of opportunity and cheap labor for those who lay hold of it. Yes. Oh, we're so close to the next one. So close. Actually, there's nothing we can do for that one. So what doctrine would we choose? Combine operations? Get way more ground support, but we don't have no aircraft. More organization. Um, we don't. Have, we just have, don't have any planes. Ground support's okay. Recovery rate, organization. How much organization do we get from this side of the tree? Ten for the army, and this one gives you like organization um, for the support companies, which we do have quite a few of. So you get twenty organization, and then the air support, of course. But we don't have any of that. I always go with this one on the right here. Maneuver warfare is just we don't have that. Over here, you get quite a bit more entrenchment. Attrition planning is what I usually do. You get more army, organization, defense. You get a lot of max entrenchment. You get even... And leg infantry gets plus 15. You get more population, a better training level. <clears throat> so you get a total of, like, 20 organization for, like, infantry. Way more max entrenchment, like, 12 and a half. Max planning. And then even 7 more organization as well. 
even more organization for like infantry, which is what we're going to be using majority of the time. So I don't understand why I choose. Like I was recommended to choose the furthest left branch here. I I, I don't think it'd be really worth it for us, especially if we can like bait the enemy to like just wailing themselves on our line to give us a lot more army XP. Oh, we need more energy. Oh crap, that's not good. <sighs> Man. So I'm going to keep going with this route. More entrenchment is good and all. I mean, even the organization is good on attack as well, so... More soft attack is nice, though. Don't get me wrong, it is nice. We just don't have all the materials we need, though, so... Alright, bring in the talent. <clears throat> it's not losing anything now. United Jinan. Centralized administration. Decentralized. Oh, chosen decentralized. War support? Oh, crap. Increase local reserves. You know what? I'm okay. I, I prefer the infrastructure. We might, get, we might get more resources, so. Two brothers still. While the names have been changed, the borders have been redrawn, the simple fact remains that Yunnan and Guizhou are not the same land and cannot be treated as such. Under the watchful eye of Luhan, only the highest level of administration shall be fully changed. And local life may go on as much as it had before the merging of the two. The boss's boss may change and the taxes are paid to a different man, but oh, it is best not to offend unnecessarily. <clears throat> yeah, getting that liquid reserves, I'm not too concerned about. Yeah. Dead GP ratio just fell quite a bit, which is awesome. Oh, okay, we got that back. Nice. Even though we definitely need more oil. What are you using oil for? We just have negative five. Oh, it's probably because of factories. That's right. Artillery's not bad. Um, booping. Two, two. I mean, you're basically all the same, so... You two are what? Oh, we only two of those divisions. That's fine. Get rid of that one. That's fine. Um, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Bring the talent. Why not? The next research slot would be great. <clears throat> Poverty's getting worse, which is really bad, but whatever. Two better still. Nice. A third research slot would be really good. Um, really focus on industry quite a bit. Factory output. Ooh, but that's a little bit ahead of time. Super good production factor. We could do that. Or we get some better engineers. Get some more guns. Let's go with that one because we have a research bonus anyways. Do you brothers still? Ra uh, rational infrastructure. Perhaps the greatest enemy of wealth in Jinan is its poor infrastructure. Winding through mountains and roads often leads to nowhere or to towns long since declined after the war. As a ruler of two provinces, it is still finally possible to rationalize and connect their infrastructure both and with all the benefits which accompany as such endeavors. Oh wow, this is looking a lot better now. Not bad. Yeah, we might have to abandon parts of this Guizhou and stuff like that. Let's see. We just need a lot of guns. I need to edit these divisions so I can actually make these guys smaller and take off recon companies so we can actually produce more divisions. Like, just straight infantry for quite a while. Do we actually get a political power? We got point zero two. Not great, but not bad. Eight a month. That is it's pretty decent, not going to lie. That's pretty decent. And then we'll, of course, let the work begin. Order has finally been restored to the lands of Jinan. The United Whole, the investment of both money and talent, started accumulating the cities and the fields. We have achieved recognition of the world over. In this new era of stability, economic progress, shall continue on without end from the families closest to Luhan, shall be the forefront of it. Let the new work begin. Nice. Oh, they got more worse, which is nice and all, but still. Ah, uh, we can't get that one. Dang it. Transistor computing, nice. After that one, 1970 stuff. We could go with that one just in case. Let's grab some better engineers because some of our divisions have them, and that'd be really good to use. It gets more soft attack for some of our guys too. You know, what? I might edit this because I don't know how many divisions we're actually going to have when the war begins. So, um, something like that maybe instead. Maybe. Just let it deploy to Kunming, that's fine. Just a little bit more political power would be great. Just a little bit more. Oh, why did I do it like this? Of course, they do have a radar facility right there. Which could help out quite a bit, actually. And making sure that enemy doesn't have it, so. Whee! Only nine divisions. Do we have enough to go? No, we don't have enough to cover the border. That sucks. Well, let the work begin, and something funky might happen. Surplus is not bad. 58. Almost 2% growth. We're quite decentralized. Hopefully get even more 
Uh, oh, we need more energy. Crap. Factory output. Guns are good. Sport equipment is looking slightly better. Anti tank is not bad. Artillery is not bad. Goodness gracious. I just hope I made the right decisions. Man. 2.2%. It's not bad. Dead GP ratio did fall down just slightly more. Alright, so with that stuff done, as much as I want to grab that, 50% output is really good. It's a little bit ahead of time, so we'll grab that one too later. I'll uh, get some more defense. We're definitely going to need it, so. Hey, 0.03. 50% more is not bad. 45 days, 47 days. Man, I'm. Don't want to do poorly here, that's all. Uh, how's this looking? Three. That's going to take forever to do. Crap. Alright, well. Now what? Alright, so. Genon Autonomous Government Tree. Survey the land. Growth and so on. Ooh, poverty gets better, though. Oh, look at this. Look at this. This is going to do really well for us. Showing up weaknesses. Opening new mines. Um, let's see. Resource and industry focus is probably the best one to do. Japanese equipment. Drawing closer to China. New facilities. Ooh, my goodness. Immoral practices. Oh, we get slavery. The bottom line. Oh, my gosh. Showing up for weaknesses, though. More political power, taming the land. Construction. Landlords have to have their say. Oh, God. Look the other way. Old connections. Flatten the soil. Lay down the road. It's not bad. Political power, heed their advice. A government of friends. A government of friends. Oh, you lose even more political power. Holy crap. Economic ties. Strength of the, the Burma Road. Order and progress. That looks really flipping good. Construction is okay. I think the one on the left side is probably the way we're going to go. Because that just looks better overall. Playing to our strengths. Because really focus on industry. An economy, poverty, which is not bad. You get a few more resources, too, which is something we could really, really use. Get more output. You get, oh, thermal electric stations. We definitely need those immediately. Every inch surveyed. Power tools. This would be really good. Oh, God, there's so much I want to do. Not once stone left unturned. That's really good for steel, though. Oh, wait. We go from centralized agriculture with basic mechanization immediately. Oh my goodness. Well, playing to our strengths. A good city Jinan has been undervalued by the establishment of Nanjing in Tokyo. Our fields and forests grow thick with produce. Our mines are deep and well dug. Our peasants work hard as hard and for as little pay as any peasant in the whole sphere. There's room here for improvement, of course. Our fields are great, but still too small. Too ancient in the design. Our mines could be dug so much deeper, so much more greedily, and our peasants often have enough time in the day to partake in indol indolence. indolence. And they would not suffer much to be a little hungrier. We understand this is not a conventional wisdom. The reorganized government seeks to move beyond a mere ba basket. This suits us in two ways. First of all, the demand for raw materials grows ever stronger as new factories flicker to life. And second of all, the stomach of the sphere will grow no less hungry as cities rise and sprawl like the dirt, like the wild mushrooms we export in great, in inadequate quantities. We'll see as the mantle is the true breadbasket of the sphere, and as you now will grow or provide the raw firmament, they shall twist into the miracles of a new age. <clears throat> More growth is not bad. Growth in the southwest. Poverty slowly improve, which is not bad, but... Growth will go up, and industrial expertise will benefit from this. I want to get those thermal electric plants just in case. Agriculture is not bad. <sighs> New mines, I think. What do we want? We can wait for that one, maybe slightly. So I think we're going to go with this one first, on this side. Because I, I really don't care about moral practices too much. I don't think it's going to help us out that much. So... You get more political power, but you lose political power. Oh, crap. Mm, state control, illegal control. Get more output. Yeah. Eh. I want to get at least down here. I want those thermal electric plants just for these guys up here. Nowhere sure to invest. There's a common misconception in the wider world that you know is unimportant to small countries surrounded by the sphere with little to offer for the businessman and the speculator. The truth of the matter is that the greatest state of Xinan is one of the few nations of the world that has the makings of sustainable or reliable profits for investors who want to steer clear of riskier investments. 
Recent events in the world history have revealed to anyone with a sense that the international financial markets are as stable as an elderly slave carrying half a ton of coal on their back. With that in mind, we must show the world that the one thing that will never be depleted is the value of the things in actuality. That every barrel full of ore, every sack of grain or bale of tea can be held in the hand. <clears throat> This is the wealth that cannot be spirited away. This is the wealth that won't endure. This is what where the sensible money belongs. So come one. Come all investors of the world. You'll find in the Gina on the stage and stability that you've been so long denied. It's almost 65, so that's good to get. Um Policy effectiveness would be good too, but still. 60. Keep working on that stuff for now. Uh, anything else here? External threats. External so, no threats, huh? There you go. There you go. Do this, yes. Absolutely. Look at the helmets and start the courses. <clears throat> Luan watches the unending line of advisors shuffle into the meeting, each more great than the last. They were land surveyors, tax collectors, accountants, hardly the crown jewels of any social circle. But lack of color in each of their suits, as well as their faces, had brought this expectation to a low he had never before experienced. Eventually, the shuffling stopped and the governor peered around, peered around from the spot which he had not moved an inch from. He cleared his throat, then spoke and did not speak, stop speaking for some time. Uh oh, uh oh. His focus shifted from the open, opening new mines, advancing methods of agricultural production, and even to prioritizing the region's lackluster industry. Ultimately, he pressed the absolute necessity of economic modernization. Nothing could block this, and every sacrifice was necessary. Though he never fooled himself <clears throat> into believing that he was by any means a magnificent orator, Luhan was nevertheless dismayed by the lack of a reaction. Only hushed skepticism had descended across his somber audience. Murmurs of unaffordable costs and impossible objectives were surfaced. The governor's simmering resentment began to boil over. You cannot sow a hundred seeds and expect a hundred flowers to bloom. It is your job to fertilize the soil and tend to the shoots in order to ensure an abundant yield is reaped. It is not your job to quash those same seeds before there has been a chance for them to grow. Not another word was spoken in retaliation. The functionaries rolled over and prepared themselves before they inevitably would have to turn to the spiraling plans that had been laid before them. Each of them now fully aware that the weight of the progress was now squarely on their backs. Modernization is worth any price. 61 days, that's not bad. <clears throat> Luan goes worse. Luan gazed at the map of Jinan for some time. It had been uh, commissioned by him. Hiring the best Japanese surveyors and geography experts to pinpoint where and how the deepest deposits of minerals and rare earths can be found with it, he could target the riches hiding in the depths of Yunnan's bosom in the recently annexed Guizhou, and meeting the increasing demands of Gaolong, Zongwu, and Nanjing. <clears throat> the door to his office opened, and came his secretary bearing a report from the labor statistician regarding the most optimal distribution of wages to keep as much money in the hands of the government, as much money going to the reorganized republic as possible. He walked in, dropped the report, and left without another word. The secretary refused to even look at Luhan. For a moment, he just stared. <clears throat> Printed simply at the bottom of the report was its findings. The most optimal distribution of wages was simply not to pay them at all. As an addendum, the work hours of the workers began to increase by another four hours, leaving them with barely enough time to sleep. Only with these conditions could Nanjing's ravenous appetite be met. Outside his window, the sun shined brightly. The clouds rolled lazily across the vi sky. Vivid visions of the kind of depredations Chinese workers suffered daily in his mines and fields flashed under his eyes. But Lu Han banished him with a blink. It was for the good of all China. It was for the good of all China. Report accepted with no reservations. Implement at once. Oh boy. Oh wow, surplus really sucks now. Well, at least we got some growth still going. How's this? Oh, we're gonna get maybe to acceptable next, maybe? That'd be kinda nice. Because going this way, we get more stability, which would be really nice too. Nowhere sure to invest. Expand what we have. Juno is not without factories, small things, outdated things. These factories are almost worse than no factories at all, as they taunt us with their inadequacy. There's a reason we put forward our mines and fuels as the flagships of Jinan's economy, hiding our shameful attempts at industrialization. The small factor humiliation can stand no longer. Jinan's a great state, no matter how, what anyone says. We have an industrial capacity to match our greatness, and that be begins by taking the investment from abroad and expanding our existing factories. We can extend our factories and redirect peasants to work in them. We can improve on their outdated methods of manufacture, on their archaic organization. We can bring the president of Jinan and transform them into the proletariat of Jinan. We shall see the chimneys and rise high and proud over our lands as the goods of our fields and mines can finally flow into our found factories no one else's. Nowhere sure to invest. Oh, look at this. We actually made a division. Two of the representatives of the Zaibatsu and those few Chinese firms in similar attendance. The room was well proportioned. But to Luhan and to Yunnan, it was extravagant and very fitting for each such an important meeting. Luhan, of course, knew how wealthy Yunnan was in minerals and workforce. He knew that it was not wealthy in industry or capital, and this had to be rectified. 
This is what had motivated his offer and what had brought these powerful men to his capital. The trade proposal was simple, and out of respect for the station, Luhan did not waste her time with flat, empty platitudes. He focused on the greed, on their motivation for profit. He offered them the confluence of a large workforce, co low cost of living, and a proximity of raw materials available at very low prices in return. They would invest in the state, developing its industry and injecting very needed hard-earned currency into the economy. The acceptance of this offer by the representatives was equally swift. They knew a deal when they saw it, and you now they saw a new frontier for rapacious exploitation and tremendous profit. They could not, would not allow this opportunity to pass by, so they did not. She can lose Han. One by one, each of them smiled, and to the bureaucrats facilitating the meeting and making records of the pact, it was as if they were so many sharks. Opportunity for all. We can do that one next immediately, and I want to do that one, but... You factories. I do want to do this one just to help our poverty, just for a little bit. Okay, this is looking pretty bad right now. And this one's... Eh, it's okay. Growth in the southwest. With our recent expansion, we now have more direct trading linked to the rest of the sphere. This is a golden opportunity to bring our bountiness harvest to wider, hungry, and better paying markets. It's essential if we ever capitalize on our verdant agriculture that we would let the world know we know we exist. We're open to trade and have the best rice money can buy. A determined advertising campaign and meeting with big names and agriculture business will help the world know that they should be buying from us. We can redirect food that is currently being wasted, rotting in the fields, or flattening or fattening peasants to an inter international market hungry for well for the food. While we're at it, we can make use of our impressive biodiversity to sell food abroad that no one else can. There are more than 800 varieties of wild mushrooms that grow in prod prodigious amounts of Jinan. <clears throat> Some locals assume the mushrooms they pick belong to them. We have an official document that will disabuse them of such silly notions. Pretty much, man. Pretty much. More growth is good. More expert industrial expertise would be good, but... Oh, man. We definitely needed that war sport, too. Real was not bad. Expand what we have. To the forces of the state, the meeting of two men in Kunming was mundane and in the extreme. A labor representative was meeting the organizer of a cart service. This suited the man perfectly and served as a perfect cover for the report of a spy to a communist infiltrator. The man from the CPC demanded swiftness in reporting, and the labor representative did not disappoint. Providing a rapid recounting of Luhan's latest efforts to expand Yunnan's nascent industrial base, he reported the vast injections of Japanese and Chinese capital, which had driven an equally vast increase in the number of operating factories within the state. Most importantly, he reported on the enormous increase and in unrest that accompanied this increase, as foreign overseers immediately and overwhelmingly exploited the workforce, paying the least possible for the most work possible, with no care for safety. He reported on the fertile grounds that had been offered for a revolt. The man from the CPC, a lifelong revolutionary, agreed. The oppressed worker was, after all, the perfect revolutionary. He had once been one himself, but he also knew a hard won lesson that without proper preparation and coordination, any such rebellion would be doomed to failure. So they would prepare, they would wait, they would dream, they would reorganize, and they would, and only then they would strike when the time was right and when they could have maximum effort, then, and only then they would march to victory. Wait, watch, and be ready. How much is it going lower every day? Week, um... Cool. Um, can you do that? Please size is zero. So, that's not bad. It's still going down? Ooh. What investors? Slightly more. An evening in Kunming. It was evening in Kunming. As Chen, an informant for the Communist Party of China, crossed back into the capital of Yunnan to connect with his cell, he reflected on the surprise at how chaotic Yunnan was becoming under Luhan's supposedly secure rule. The country so far from being pacified as Gao Zongwu and Luhan claimed was filling with chaos and instability. The rural localities were filled to the brim with bandits and bandits, many of whom were par paratizing the increasingly relative the rest of peasantry. The peasantry, in turn, was up in arms, because the government seemed to have only one priority, the welfare of the landlords and their wealth. Obviously, the information reflected while this was enough to give the lie to the brave claims of the traitor KMT about how peaceful, modern, and stable Jinan had become under the rule of the collaborationist government. It was not enough for the rebellion that Marshal Yi had a vision. For Yunnan was to rise and revolt against the oppression of the Japanese imperialists, so the presence of the countryside had to be armed. As the informant reached the place where his cell had arranged to meet, he was already sketching out ways he could smuggle arms to the peasant farmsteads. Not merely for self-defense, of course, but as a preparation for the struggle to come. Soon it would, become, it would come all about. For the armed situation? Yeah. NRA. Yeah, I'm okay. we're okay. <clears throat> New facilities? Yeah, I'll do that one next. Our factories are coming along nicely. Their tired timbers team with workers, working every hour we need we give them. But they're still insufficient. If Yunnan is ever to have an industry worth uh, sh shaking a stick at, we need to treat it like the serious issue it is. The days where we can just plaster over the cracks in our system are coming to a close, and we need a whole new set of developments. This radical change is a whole new deal for Jinan. It will take thousands of peasants who currently work dutifully in fields and mine and press them into factories. It will require the building of whole new towns, laid out and located in a new, more rational way. In short, this program of construction is the most essential cog in the machine of modern Jinan. The facility of this building, our illustrious government has declared that we will create a new investment ba bank of Kunming. This bank will help negotiate with foreign capital as well as providing a financial foundation for our works. Great debt and tremendous work is needed to complete or complete this project, but it must be done. For a Jinan that makes, not just a Jinan that extracts. 
grew up in the southwest. <clears throat> in defiance of the exasperated advice of his protective staff, Luhan has taken it upon himself to travel the state economic advisors to the most rural parts of Yunnan. All said, all had said it was foolish for him to go, given the clear threats and dangers of assassins, but Luhan knew himself that the very opposite was true as well. He cannot uh, be, be seen to run and hide. He cannot be seen to be avoiding the countryside, such as an invitation only to more unrest, more dissent. Besides, his presence also ensured that the bureaucrats dispatched performers dispatch performed the function to the best of their abilities, rather than that to which was a minimal minimum acceptable. So Luhan's bodyguards surrounded him, and he proceeded from camp to camp, town to town, and village to village, making sure that the people who knew who was in command. It was near the end of the trip when he thought the threat of violence passed that the assassin made his move. He positioned himself masterfully, exploiting a blind corner to avoid the gaze of security staff. He crossed the open space in the blink of an eye and aimed his weapon masterfully straight at Lu's Han's heart. He pulled the trigger. The weapon did not fire, though. The instant later, the assassin had been buried under bodyguards of soldiers, beaten into unconsciousness, and securely tied for transportation to prison. A dangerous gamble, Luhan thought, that he had undertaken for himself by coming out to these remote regions, but one that had paid off. One that would only further his image. Celestial intervention, no doubt. On simplicity and naivety. Naivety. If one were to ask Luhan what he thought about the National Southwestern Associated University, he would have to no choice but to say it's complicated. On the one hand, he repeatedly refused Tokyo and Nanjing's request to shut down the dissent in the NSAU, or failing that, the school itself. That was because he wanted to use it for the political balancing act he played all the time as governor of Yunnan, as well as help keep social discontent in check. On the other hand, the dissident voices were going from annoyance to a genuine threat to the stability of the government in Yunnan. Rumor even had it that some of these people in the NAS, NSAU faculty were even secretly helping the insurgencies. Recently, he had ordered some nominal crackdowns on the colleges uh, or college, and then arrested some of the more loudmouth intellectuals. But he couldn't push further, given his reluctance to do such things in the first place. Today, Lu Han had, begun, had been informed about a young loudmouth named Zhang Zemin. Looking at Zhang's blustering, Lu could only conclude that this stripling was too young, too simple, and sometimes naive. As an elder, Lu Han had seen much more of the world. After all, he had stood and fought against the Japanese invaders in the countless battles in Zhuzhou. Wuhan and Cheng Xia, not least among them. This Jiang, on the other hand, had nothing, had nothing better to do with his life but fiddle with circuits and try to make big news by criticizing Lu with Western theories, as well as fabricating and spreading scandals about his regime. Now Lu starts feeling angry to these incapable kids. Perhaps, Lu thought, I should go in and leave the crackdowns myself to offend these kids a bit, if they're not too agile to catch up to me. He shook that thought off with a few minutes. Never mind that, I'm too busy with making a big fortune for Jinan anyways, and being low-key is smarter. Besides, no matter what these pointy head scholars say, I'll back Mr. Gao to the hilt. I have no responsibility to teach these little imbeciles my life lessons as an elder. Not their grand I'm not their grandfather, and I don't pay for their anything. Why should I worry about the capabilities? An opportunity lost? And actually, right now, we're going to do this. I'm going to duplicate these guys. This might be wrong to do, but... Basic. Basic imp. And I'm going to remove this. You know what? Just because we need bodies. We have to have bodies. So that mine, we're going to train these guys instead. These guys are not bad. Make it one more, but then go like... Three. At a time. Just because we need bodies. Badly. Just straight infantry. And of course, anti tank, but still. Okay, you can go, go lower by one. The Burma Road revived! Hey, after long, hard months of labor. The Burma Road has finally been restored to its former glory. Hundreds of miles of shattered roads and collapsed bridges have been swept away and replaced by modern, robust infrastructure. The gateway to Jinan has been thrown open. <clears throat> of course, certain NRA clusters have woefully invaded extermination, clinging on to their pitiful existence and harassing blameless merchant caravans along the pathway still. But that's all the least past dare to do anymore. For a little garrisons have taught them a splendid lesson with uh, ha hails of freshly supplied lead. The age of relentless banditry is past. All of our drivers on the road need to do today is to exercise the bare minimum of caution. Already goods and resources have begun flowing once more from Burma to Jinan, and then onwards to the rest of the Republic of China. Trucks stuffed full of consumer goods from every brand imaginable uh, quickly speed. The precious cargo to newly opened stores all across the region. The people of Jinan, old and young, peasant and worker, Han and Yi, all infatuated with the new clothes, toys, and kitchenware appliances, are only too willing to pay the surprisingly low prices. <clears throat> The same good fortune cannot be said of the village artisans, weavers, cottage industrialists. Jinan's isolation allowed them to persist even as the rest of the world changed. Or the reconstruction of the Burma, Burma Road, these separate worlds have violently collided and this timelessness is no longer possible. Far away from both the new aspiring consumers and old fang producers of the southwest, Luhan sits, content his eyes however, gaze firmly towards the horizon. It isn't just about the prosperity of two provinces, no, the Burma Road above else will make China strong, his dream, his sacred mission, is one step closer to realization. New opportunities lie ahead. GDP will increase by 10%. Nice. <clears throat> Get more growth, too. Yearly surplus looking pretty decent now. I like that a lot. Hey, that's looking a little better. Slightly better. Down the Burma Road. 
A man makes his way down the Brummer Road sent by the MPA to the NRA. His office is designed to be as inconspicuous as possible, just a simple cloak and plain clothes. Getting past the border is easy. The customs official may have been bribed to let him and many others like him through. Once upon a time, he was abandoned, imprisoned by the Japanese for wrecking havoc on the countryside. Once he reached prison, the MPA offered him a new path in life. This spring him out of jail if he would go south and train with the NRA in preparation for the liberation of China. Once, this man was abandoned, fighting only for himself now. He's on his way to becoming a soldier, and he'll fight for the future of China. Every little man's story is different. Their lives are all unique, yet many follow the same, general's, the same general cadence. Bandits and criminals being sprung from prison and sent down the Burma Road. Their motives vary from person to person. Some fight for their own personal redemption, driven by the passion to prove their own change in nature. Some fight for the country, <clears throat> being propelled to forward out of a love for China. Some fight for revenge, uh, uh, seeking to tear down the Japanese for the humiliation of China. Whatever the reasons may be, they all walk down the same path. The NRA accepts each and every one of them, forming an underground army of rebels ready to spring into action and reclaim their ho homeland. All this happens under the nose of the Japanese, their eyes and ears in the area blinded by mountains of money. The stage where an insurrection is being set, the pieces are placed with methodical precision. For the ones placing them know one immutable truth, the fate of China rests on their efforts. An army forms. Oh, no guns for that one, that makes sense. Oh, we have more, more production units now. Support equipment and anti-tank, really. We're going to need a lot of guns. New factories, but I know what, you know what, we're going to come up here first. I need, we need more of this. Uh, Fawn's day always begins with a meager bowl of white congi, while the dawn's first rays begin to peak above the horizon. The daily trek to his workplace across through rivers and rolling hills. Mighty roads and sundered fields once a verdant green with rice crops, now all the remains of which are the scars of irrigation channels still flooded. Fans toil away for 10, 11, 12 hours in a workshop producing nothing in the midst <clears throat> of nowhere. His bosses, taskmasters carrying clipboards and pencils, have a new form or order for him every week. Something new to assemble, some different equipment and parts to produce. Specialization is a luxury such a rural manufacturer cannot afford instead. The workshop simply makes what is in demand for a few buyers. Tools for landlords and businesses to equip their own workers with. Firearms and ammo for the local authorities to fight bandits and thieves with. And the machine parts for the cloaked men and false aliases. They are used seemingly unknown. No questions are asked. Not by Fawn. Not by any of his co-workers. Not by his overseers and the manager while not money uh, keeps flowing. <clears throat> That's a simple job. Fonds. He takes the pieces and parts brought by others, other such workshops or made by his colleagues and fixes them together to create a finished or at least more complete product. Perhaps he should be thankful. He has not run the risk of burns from smithing and smelting, nor does he seem to have careful careful not to have his arm amputated from a machine, machining accident, yet he labors all day with no rest save a short lunch of mixian and lukewarm chicken broth, kept on his toes by the threat of replacement should he lapse in productivity. He collects a daily pittance of an hour of wage long after dusk and makes a pilgrimage home, only offer the respite of a never-filling supper of rice and stale boiled greens, the most he and his wife can afford. And he is left each midnight questioning the point of it all, laboring away his twilight years only to survive, not to live, not to thrive, only to repeat it all again today after day. Desolation and a forgotten land. Immoral practices? Eh, that's, that hurts quite a bit. Our poverty gets worse. Need to consumer goods goes down. I want to wait for that one. Every grain is, is earned with hardship. Survey the land. Survey the states. Open new mines. Yeah, let's go this way. Survey the lands. Many of our mines have been in operation for hundreds of years. This isn't an issue on its own, but reveals a shocking lack of progress in this, the cornerstone of our economy. Our landscape is draped in mountains and plateaus. The buried bounty of the earth lies just beyond our grasp, but not for long. We must bring our eyes to bear upon these resources, opening new bold avenues of tin, lead, zinc, iron, silver, gold, and coal, as well as a hundred other roads that we shall take to prosperity. For the task, few experts we have to hand will be rallied along with a few experts in geology, geography, metallurgy, and the mining industry from the far as ways of Manchuria. The likely candidates first ne near existing mines. After these have been examined, we shall move on to new pastures that we will ripe, rip up and exploit. Once we have the facilities in place, all gathered under a new Bureau of Expansion and Efficiency Exploitation, we shall methodically and thoroughly examine the country for likely sites. The land must be numbered, weighed for its potential, and divided into new zones for development. Some of these developments will be resisted by reactionary developments, who fear progress. They will protest that they, we, we would destroy the villages, their forests, and their fields, but the march of time is inexorable. We have not yet begun their survey, but the writing is on the wall. Followed up with. Um, every inch surveyed. I mean, that's not bad to do, but still. Yeah, that would be really good to get to as well, but open new minds. More than 500 meters of ribbon, at least, is required for the hundreds of opening ceremonies we have planned for the next few months. If local stocks are inadequate, we have agents in our neighbors seeking emergency ribbon suppliers. A junior member of the Bureau of Expansion, Efficiency, and Exploitation has suggested we delay the opening ceremonies of certain mines to save on expenses. After fi firing him, we have come slightly closer to a greatly forward towards full exploitation of our natural resources. This is a tremendous movement for dozens of communities around Jinan, who will soon have access to exciting new jobs in our mine shafts. Some village villages in the end did have to be relocated, but their employment in making Jinan the master of Mel's an opportunity we make sure. We are sure that they would thank us for if we were ever asking of them. 
Having said that, a debate. Still rages in Kunming over the precise color and type of ribbon to be used. Not a single mind can be opened until this is, of course, all settled. A simple assignment. Kyung Ki enjoyed his work as a land appraiser. It gave him the opportunity to see the great sights and travel vast distances, even if it meant writing down all the minute details that most others wouldn't notice this time. He was on an assignment from the governor of Yunnan to assess the amount of valuable minerals in the area as many peasants had allegedly truly remarkable numbers. Kian had never been able to never been in the southwest of China, so he accepted the task and made his way towards the provincial capital. As soon as he got there, he began to hear rumors of communists and NRA partisans hiding out in the countryside. People whispered in the pubs and general stores about hearing guns go off in the small hours of the morning or how their cousin who worked for a minister went missing and all of a sudden. Kian didn't pay much attention or pay much mind to these speculations. The governor's aides had briefed him about this very issue, and they told him there was nothing to worry about. Surely they wouldn't lie to him like that. Despite this, he still makes note of their supposed base areas in his journal, pulls out some maps, and begins work. Nothing but tall tales, of course. Nothing but tall tales, of course. Of course, we did read this one before I uh, faded and faded out, so I'm going to read this again. Please go ahead. But we have Japanese equipment, which will be very, very important. It's not our peasants' fault that their frail bodies and lazy souls are inadequate for our needs. It is their fault that their homemade tools keep breaking when put under the necessary stresses of a modern mining e environment. <clears throat> Even the tools made by our small manufacturing base prove inadequate. No one in Jinan thinks big enough to make the tools we need. For this reason, we must look further afield for our tools. The mines of the reorganized government of Manchuria are both seeking to modernize, meaning that much of their old equipment is going to be for sale. We will be welcoming a welcome market for their cast-offs, but more excitingly, a number of Japanese manufacturers have taken notice of our efforts and have contacted us, offering us to sell the latest in drilling, extracting, and processing technology. For an extortionate price, of course, but what price is too steep when we can spend it for our peasants' welfare? Obviously, well, the answer is any price, but that's the way we'll spend it in the papers. Clearly, we need to accommodate our frail work to the latest in profit-multiplying equipment. This investment will be costly, but if it can finally bring our minds into the 20th century, it'll all be worth it. We can save money on the safety equipment, though. It's strange why they thought we'd want to buy all those helmets and lights. Very weird. Oh, we have to power. Now we can uh, survey Dalian, or Dali, not Dalian. Um, that wouldn't be bad. I'm not sure if this would be worth doing. Complete this decision and the national focus open new mines will allow further exploitation of surveyed minerals inside the state. Open new mines, huh? Oh, yeah. I mean, we already that one done already, so. You know what? Who, which one is the most resource rich right now? Yunnan? Let's do Yunnan. You, you might be able to find more there. Let's try it. And not one stone left unturned. Up until this point, we've had a compromise between what was practical and what was possible. Fortune's great city Yunnan is no longer recognized as such small minded categories, and a report by the Bureau of Expansion, Efficiency, and Exploitation has revealed that we shall soon be pushing the envelope of what, both of what we can reasonably do and what we can sanely do. New avenues of even greater exploitation will be torn from the earth. Every vein, no matter how small, shall be found, surveyed, and drained of every drop of wealth we can find. These mines, the mines we would have, will be expanded and streamlined. Mountains that up until this point have stood between us and what is rightfully ours shall be, have to be removed. Any mine which has escaped or noticed and needs to be made more efficient by removing what few token ex examples of safety and comfort remain. Finally, not even the, abo the abodes of the many of the powerful will be exempt from a surveyor's eyes. All seats will be drawn bound open mine pits. Uh, open pit mines. Government buildings will be relocated. The green forests will be burned black, then return to green as the profits grow beyond the wildest imagination for most depraved accountants. No profit is too small when we seek extraction perfection. A day at the mines. Uh, they say the miner's body tells the story of his life. Every scar, scrap, a scab, every bit of callus that was a signal for how long they had been slaving away 10,000 leagues under the earth. Many did not make it back to the surface alive. Luo Shen had held a pickaxe in his hand since he was 12 years old. <clears throat> his body. Uh... Uh, at every mark of the preceding decade, it was grueling work, but at least it gave him enough to ensure that the continued existence of his family. Luo had not known China outside of the grasp of Japanese control, but he could not say that he had any real relevance to his life. And the mines, flags, and allegiances hold little, little weight. One day, however, his overseer called in the entire crew to go over some new Japanese safety equipment that had been brought in. Luo was able to hear, bear witness to the new excavators, the lift mechanisms, safety helmets, and other gadgetry that was designed to make his work less precarious. He had never seen anything like it before, but he hoped that it would make it easier for him to smell the outside air than any other day. My hel helmet straps, it's a bit tight. It's a bit tight. More soft attack. Actually, that's not bad where we're at already. This is for the special units that we already have. Navy stuff, we're probably going to go with Greenwater Navy. Even though, probably doesn't really matter that much, but whatever. Additionally, these divisions, we got to make sure that they're really good. Um, the basic infantry are going to be just super basic. But these guys will be like the divisions we use the entire time. So we're just going to increase these guys already. Do we have enough infantry equipment? No, we don't. We don't. So these these will be the big boys that we use to pull the line. The dudes. And actually, this is, this is going back up. I think. Yeah, two point one is really bad. Um, it's fine. We have enough money that we're making right now, so we're doing okay. We're doing okay. Support one three is nice. 
Nice, very nice. Um, line attack, get some more soft attack. We're going to really make sure that our guns are perfect. They have to be perfect. Uh, modern farm techniques is not, or, yeah, techniques are not bad. I don't want to lose any more political power. The substance of the output, I need to consume goods goes down. Lose stability, get more output. I don't want to hurt industrial expertise, but this one's not bad either. Get more output here too, so let's do that one first. Every gain is earned with hardship. <clears throat> One of the lesser known features of Xinan is their prodigious water table. Rain falls on us as unrelentingly as the rest of Southeast Asia, and thousands of rivers scar a landscape like the back of an unruly peasant. And enough likes to fell a small sea, facilitate a small army of amateur poets. Waxing lyrical the howl of the sunset over their still waters is akin to a celestial rabbit with three legs. We mention this only because of the amount of sweat each harvest produces threatens to disturb this delicate balance. Or so reads a satirical pamphlet that's been circulating Kunming at a disturbing rate. The smoke from the bonfire we make of these rises is high enough that every farmer in the district would be able to see it if they had the time to look up. We know that our new policies have increased the labors of our peasants. They sweat on the patties. They stagger under every, even under heavier loads. Where animal machine cannot ser serve our needs, human flesh will provide. Nothing great has been achieved without hard work. So work they shall to make Jinan great. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Every inch survey. <clears throat> Despite Jinan having a well-developed agricultural sector, we exploit only a small part of our land. By looking to alternative solutions, such as widespread uh, land clearance, draining, and irrigation of the mass movement of peasants and slaves, we can revolutionize Jinan's agriculture. We shall need to establish a team of experts to look upon every handful of soil in the nation and compose a formal report as to how every last speck can be best used. Terrace farming. The cultivation of land previously assumed to be too inaccessible or too low yield. The possibilities are endless. This is also an essential first step in making our farms more efficient. We make decisions about what crops to grow, where they should be cultivated, and when to plant harvest out of the hands of the amateurs into the hands of professionals. Many of these illiterate peasants have been running these farms for millennia. Clearly, they're in no position to make such complex decisions. Obviously. Where are we at here now? Powerful? That's going down, which is good. Um, survey so you now. Let's see what happens with this one. We'll get more output after this one, which would be good, but still. Wow, we're really out of guns. But 15 is not bad. Every grain scrap is earned. Modern farming techniques. Even with every scrap of land we can use being brought to bear, the overwhelming majority of our land is still unsuitable for agriculture. We have two options to further extend our agricultural yields and, more importantly, our profits. The first option is the simplest. We must diversify our yields. <clears throat> Taking advantage of our incredibly geographical diversity to becoming a le leading regional producer of coffee, tobacco, and if need be, less legal crops. I also cut into our production, but the increased value of exporting luxury goods will be worth it. Of course, if it isn't, then the peasants will just have to adjust their diets. <clears throat> The second and more important option is to modernize our methods by acquiring modern equipment and the expert to teach us how to use them. Those enable us to move beyond our roots and branch out into new vis vis vistas of efficiency. If we can find no more land exploit, uh, then every hectare must offer up everything that they can. We will move beyond our limits. We will grow forever more. Three is nice. That's really good. Four, awesome. Awesome, awesome, possum. God, I just hope we do well. Every inch surveyed, of course. Sitting in his office, looking at the maps on the wall and the ledger stacked high upon his desk, the minister observed with great satisfaction the evidence of advancing advancement presented to him. Arable land usage was, after all, near Herculean effort, <clears throat> increasing at an ever-accelerating pace. Many had said it could not be done, but the mountainous countryside of Yunnan would always offer scant agricultural bounty, even if the exact opposite was true of its minerals. But new technologies, new techniques, and new efforts had proved them wrong, and the state was seeing as... Uh, oh, well, look at that. Uh, granaries becoming ever more full. <clears throat> the only negative effect that he could see in his expansion, where the reports of gradually intensifying banditry claimed by some to be formed by gangs of displaced peasants, others, however, suggested more darkly that the equipment, tactics, discipline, above all, zeal, displayed by those so-called bandits hinted at alternative identity, nationalists, or even worse, communists. The minister refused these characterizations. A short-term eruption of the disorder was understandable, given how radically land usage was being changed, but insurgency was not, and it cannot be so. That would be invite too many questions and too much scrutiny. No other reports would be clear that they were bandits, and surely of no concern. An NPA loses hope. Zheng Zisheng and Enpu had despised Luhan for the moment he had taken the mantle of leadership that even he knew was worth, unworthy of. Nevertheless, they'd stayed on. Surely they could do more good from within than without. Then came the demands. <clears throat> Fire on the unarmed peasants begging for a single week's pay to lay back for months. Cross the border to put down a revolt on the request of the Japanese. L loose, tens, loose tens of hundreds of your own men fighting not even for Yunnan, but the collaborationist dogs at Nanjing and now guard the shipments of valuable precious minerals as they were, sent straight out of the maw of the reorganized republic. Who did Luhan even serve? One thing was for sure, it wasn't the people of Yunnan, nor was it the people of China. 
The decision to do something had been swift to take, but who to help? Who to sponsor them? That debate raged for hours late into the night until finally a somber silence descended on the two. There was really only one man, wasn't there? Only one candidate who could lead both men and all of Yunnan. The next morning, they cleared both their schedules and checked those of Yunnan's highest dignitaries. Finding the man empty, Zhang Zesheng picked up the phone and said one thing to the operator. Get me Long Yun. Immoral practices. <clears throat> our economy depends on raw resources. This is news to no one. It's also not new to anyone that much of our workforce is to use an unfair and largely inaccurate term, exploitive. There's even allegations of outright slavery practiced in some parts of our economy. This is liable against the great state of Jinan. We do not practice slavery, but rather enhance employment techniques. These enhanced employment techniques are responsible for some of the most efficient business in Jinan. It's essential that we reward the uh, enterprising minds behind these techniques, perhaps with a position in a government. We should spread this technique to as many industries as we can, but if any foreign observers should raise an issue with these practices, we should remind them that we are not responsible. In fact, we had no idea that these practices were even occurring. We're already hurt, the bottom line, after all. Long Yun vi visits home. The woman was plowing the field with one hand. Alone, she rode trudging through the mud with her hoe as she, while a stump hung from her ar left arm uselessly. Behind her were three small children, each covered in dirt and filthy water, planting seeds in her wake. When he asked, she said that the harvest demands were so great that even if the rains were good, she would probably have to work day and night to plant another field, brought, bought with money borrowed at exorbitant r interest rates. She looked sadly at the oldest child, perhaps he walked on. The houses had been once full of life, and playmates were all now empty. Most were rotting, their male inhabitants either dead or hundreds of meters below his feet toiling away in the mines. When he asked where the children were, the old woman who ran the lone tea shop still standing said they were with the men. One way or another, he walked on. The village headsman was the only one left in the administration building. When he saw who had entered, he immediately stood up, but was bade to sit down again. When he heard the question that was asked, he began sputtering and saying a hundred things at once, but he was bade to wait and clear his mind. His visitor had enough time to hear the truth. Finally, the headsman spoke one sentence. Luhan, these were all his orders. The all can consuming apologetic fury threatened to overcome long yun at that instant itself that unworthy dog the darn traitor there was clearly no help left with that man now now i'll dig it, do it myself i will walk away no longer oh that's not bad a morning in guangxi it was morning in guangxi and chen by now a veteran operative in the service of the cpc was far from his home base, among people that he did not ordinarily work with the officers leading the remnant of the national revolutionary army jia wei's fiefdom Obviously, you gentlemen know all quite well how inattentive that traitor Gao and the Gaizu Pai scum have been. They're so preoccupied with their precious modernizations that they aren't paying uh, Guangxi any attention whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, the NRA officer spoke op opposite him, not shortly. Yes, we all know this too well. It's how we've maintained our freedom of action all this time. But what do you want to do? Is want us to do with that, Mr. Chen? Chen nodded. Marshal, you have sent me to make an offer to you. We propose a united front against the Japanese imperialists, an alliance between your NRA and this RCPC. Since we all want rid of the Japanese, we will need to unify with one another to at least until our nation is free once again. It's the only hope we've got. Either way, we hang together, sir, or we hang separately. The officer looked at his peers, and they all nodded at him. I can agree with that in principle. Where are the specifics? Chen smiled, knowing he succeeded. Well, sir, the bottom line. This will be really good. <clears throat> Even though I don't want more centralization, but whatever, it's fine. The economy of United has come a long way, but it's a tremendous way, and it's still pulled by many hands in many directions. Strong hands, to be sure, yet these hands would all be stronger if they only could pull in unison. The town has come to centralize the Bureau of Expansion, Efficiency, and Exploitation, and the Central Investment Bank of Kunming and the various local boards of agriculture into one unified economic command. Just as an army needs a single leader, so must all of Jinan's economy have a single supreme controller. Now we've laid the foundations deep and strong, now we have the opportunity to calibrate and fine-tune the economy until it sings. Our new unified office of economic development will put our surveyors and inspectors to work finding the fat to trim and chaff to shed. We should determine exactly how little we need to give a worker for them to keep on working at maximum efficiency. We should determine exactly how to get the most wealth out of our mines, farms, and factories year after year. We shall build a new leaner society, one where we do not suffer from the waste or corruption. In pursuit of this goal, there is only one singular line we are unwilling to cross. The bottom line. Eh, that's not as good as what the four, but whatever. Words of Master Long. To General Zen Zesheng and Empu, greetings. <clears throat> Though to the eyes of my cousin Luhan, I may seem blissfully unaware of any conspiracies taking place behind the scenes. I am in fact fully cognizant of your plans against him. You should not be surprised I did not become Marshal of the Southwestern King of Yunnan by sitting around and doing nothing with a stupid smile on my face. I am aware of the way in which the battle lines have been drawn, and I am fully willing to side with the National Protection Army to free the motherland. While Luhan and Guo Zongwu might call revanchist madness, I call a re reassertion of our nation's ancient rights unjustly usurped from it. <clears throat> However, I must make one request. Whatever you do, I must insist that you spare a thought for my, uh, cousin in his old age, whereas collaboration is indeed both beneath contempt. Blood remains thicker than water, and I must not allow my relatives to be slaughtered on my watch, no matter how what they have done. It is my express wish that when we are when we of the NPA take power, Luhan should be imprisoned but not harmed. I hope that you will be able to meet this request of mine, sign Long Yun, Vice Governor of Yunnan. Surgeon Caesar acting. I have to stand against tyranny. Though several weeks after the fleeting after fleeing the tax collectors that way, I realized that what he'd become a bandit. 
It was not something he had tried to be, to, to, uh, try to be, not something he had relished or found solace, and it was a simple, unavoidable fact that one that he accepted with this stirring calmness. Every few days, he and the rest of his newfound allies would find some new estate or traveler to prey on. They would brandish weapons, and in rare cases, use violence to force them to surrender their food and valuables. Then, they would disappear deep into the countryside. It was the aftermath of one of these raids that Wei and his band heard the screaming coming from some village, a place that his allies had decided was unworth the effort of attacking. It seemed that the government had tried to come to a different conclusion. The band watched from the hills as tax collectors and the guards marched men and women into the dirt road. There was crying solving. Old men prostrated them in the dirt. Are we just going to watch this, said Wei, after a few moments of silence? Below them, the tax collectors had begun searching houses. A few men turned to look at him, their expressions ranging from shock to sadness to be amusement. This isn't our fight, he said one. If you get involved, we'll be bandits, said Wei. A few of the men broke his gaze to look at their feet. You found me when I was cold and alone. You took me in when you could have killed me. We need to do the same for these people or all will ever be some effing cowards and government laptops. Animals that eat whatever scraps the government leaves behind. <clears throat> he was shocked at his own moral outrage. Wei waited for the men to laugh or curse at him. He expected them to expel him from the group and leave them to die on the hill. And soon a few of the other men began to nod. They picked up their rifles. An older man from the f back of his, an older man from the back cleared his throat. I'm a lot of gosh darn things, but I'm not a coward. If you want to fight, let's effing fight. A march of battle, then an unexpected victory over the oppressors. The orders visit. Zing Zhang and An Anpu had held a gathering with a host of colleagues, <clears throat> who, as it turned out, were mostly revanchist members of the NPA and the United Army. Though on paper, and as far as Yunnan's intelligence establishment knew, this was just Zhang and An arranging a celebration for the octogenarian long continued health. It was a fact of meeting of people who had brought thought of themselves mostly alone beforehand. It turned out, much to all the officers' surprise, that Lu Han's blind devotion to Gao Zongwu modernization program had drawn more enemies than any one of the officers that had in his entire lifetime. Expressions such as, you hate him? I hate him too, were quite common. And Zhang's hand was a letter from Long Yu, indicating his willingness to join the NPA. It was about to pass it around when Long himself appeared at the door. After he was ushered in, Long sat down in the chair. Zhang had gotten hold of him and spoke, spoke briefly. <clears throat> you gentlemen are aware that I'm on your side from here on in, with one major condition, correct? Yes, sir, said one of the officers, but I'm not sure what this condition was. I don't think General Zhang got it before he joined us, sir. Long smiled slightly. Here's my condition. When you take my cousin prisoner, do not execute him. Unprison him under decent conditions if he does not resist. The officers thought at first hesitant, nodded, and, and spoke for all of them. We can agree to that, Marshal. Long smile widened somewhat. You very good, gentlemen. He looked around and gestured to a dining table where food was being piled up for the men to eat. Carry on with the gathering, then. We can afford to rest a bit. <clears throat> There's a lot of resistance from the NRA. Not the NP... Oh, I guess this is going up as well, I suppose, now. Yeah. Uh, there you go. And moral practices. Ma did not feel like a real person. He had not felt like a real person for a long time. Every day he woke up early in the shack, crammed alongside with his wife, children, and his parents. Every day before the sun rose, he walked down a suit-choked dirt road, past run-down farms, the pollution-soaked rice fields, and strange bombed-out ruins. Every day he found himself in a throng of other men and women marching towards the doors of a factory. What did he make? Was he good at his job? Did his work make life easier for people somewhere? He didn't know. He didn't care. As one could become specialized beyond reason, beyond meaning. Every day was the same, making the same small part as metal coil that was passed along a conveyor belt to other men like him, wearing the same clothes in the same conditions, living in the same colorless lives. The existences were endless toil, interruption only by the occasional breakdown of the conveyor belt or maiming of some nameless, irreplaceable laborer. Sometimes he would see rats scurrying along the floor, chewing on bits of an amputated flesh. He wasn't sure if they were real. If they were, the men's carrying clipboards on the catwalks he did not notice. Every few weeks, one of the men carrying a clipboard would give Ma his paycheck, a thin envelope with a full, few bills in it, a fraction of a fraction of the value of his labor. He would take it and trudge back from the factory down the dirty, polluted road to his dilapidated home. He would press the envelope into his wife's hand and mumble an apology about it not being enough and about it never being enough, and then collapse on his bed. Then after a night of dreamless sleep, he would wake up and the cycle would begin anew. There's no exit, no escape, but shoring up our weaknesses. Actually, about this one... Uh, you get the bottom line as well. But our authority over the province, now provinces, has always been dubious now. Our position is more in question than ever before, with insurgents, partisans, and bandits haunting the countryside and the army paralyzed by conspiracy and squabbling. Lu Han will consolidate his control over Jinan by building up the main roads and expanding the territory's transport networks, ultimately better connecting our land to that of the Nanjing government through a road from Kunming to Chongqing. Our other key objectives will include securing the cooperation of Jinan's landlords through bribery and exchanging favors to strengthen our influence and in clout and seeking investment from Nanjing and Tokyo in order to facilitate local economic development and exploitation of our abundance of natural resources, ensuring that we are financially and materially equipped. But I think that's going to be the end of this longish episode. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. Let me know how I've done so far and whether we're ready or not to take the fight eventually to the rest of the sphere. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.